the world doesn't need any comedians. Mm -hmm. You really have to like have the audacity to just go, I'm gonna do this. And for me it was, I think it was, you know, I've never done heroin, but I imagine it's like you're chasing <laughs> that high. Welcome back to the School of Greatness, everyone. We've got Jim Gaffigan in the house, my man. Thanks for having fellow me. Fellow Midwest guy. There you go. Fellow D3 All-Star football player. I, I wasn't an All-Star, but All, thank all -star you. All-Star center. <laughs> I was a center. Walk, um, walk out of Purdue. Did you ever play at Purdue? No. No. I, uh, I didn't, you know, it was, it was one of those things where I uh, applied <laughs> To Georgetown, that was my dream in high school was to go to Georgetown. And where was it? Where's Georgetown? You mean in Georgetown DC. in DC? Gotcha. And, and it was D three uh, then. It was D three. It was my dream to go there. My brother went there. Uh -huh. I didn't get in. Like my dreams were crushed. <laughs> uh, and so, uh, and Purdue's a great school, yeah. and I got in there. And you know, I I don't even know if I had plans to play football at Purdue. I think it was kind of like my dad was like, hey. There's, uh, you know, there's an opportunity for you to walk on. Like, I think we got a letter from the coach. Like, he'd love for you to walk on. And I'm like, Feel like a practice dummy. Now I have to, <laughs> now I have to walk on <laughs> to a Big Ten school when I probably, you know, I probably weighed 190. No way. You know what I mean? And so you weren't the strapping 240 I was that not, you are now. I wish I was 240. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I was, uh, I was a different man. You know, I was uh, in different shape. Yeah. You know, 190. Yeah, did I was you, probably 190. Did you play center at Purdue practice squad or? Uh, no, I just, I walked on, I, I did it for, you know, I don't know, five weeks and I was like, this yeah. is insane. Yeah. And there was, I remember there was a meeting and the guy who was the fitness guy was like, he actually goes, I don't think that um, you're gonna be able to gain weight with muscle <laughs> to play in the Big Ten. And I was like, I didn't want to do this anyway. Right. So. But it was a great experience. You know, it's fun to, to, to terrify yourself by doing stuff like that. Yeah. And that's I, not to say I'm not a coward. I am a coward. But every now and then you got to challenge yourself. Do you think you would be uh, where you are in your comedy career without walking on at Purdue? And actually taking that fear and challenge and saying, I'm going to do this thing, even though it's the, it doesn't make any sense. I'm not big enough. I'm not fast enough. I can't put on the muscle. I'm not going to play, but I'm going to do this anyways. Yeah, I, you know, I wish, I mean, I'm, I wish I knew what was mm -hmm. the things that contributed. I think also I was raised to kind of, you know, I was the part of this family that had been in the U.S. for a while, but my dad was the first one to go to college and mm -hmm. uh, I was raised to seek security, to wear a tie and um, get a job where you can't get laid off and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And so... I, I think probably in my 20s, uh, I mean, I graduated, I got a finance job, I was miserable. Um, so that was one step. But then, you know, in my early 20s, my mother died and I was mm -hmm. like, all bets off. Like the whole charade of life kind of being fair is is not true. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And I know compared to other people's stories, that's not that dramatic. but. For me, like, I was like, well, if this, you know, she's 50 and she she's going to die, I have to figure out what I want to do now. Wow. How old were you then? I was probably 22. Okay. And dad's still around? Yeah. Yeah. How was that for you for that transition? Did you say, I'm going right into the thing, the comedy right now? Did you know you wanted to get into that or was it just more? I, I was doing i had a huge fear of public speaking me too so the i worst isn't that ironic <laughs> the right? worst yeah no i used to turn beat red oh my gosh and i had found a job in new york working in advertising and i would have these ideas but i would turn red and then someone was like you gotta you know be, you know you gotta get more comfortable speaking in a group and it's not like i was in front of a, a large like, group was i was like just 10 people 10 people in a boardroom and I would just kind of hyperventilate. And so um, wow. I took these improv classes and then someone was in there, uh, a friend of mine kind of dared me to do this stand-up seminar because I would not just go and do stand-up. I needed to like 
someone to be like, hold my hand and go, here, you you are funny. Let's do this joke. So right. I did kind of a thing like that. And then... Like a uh, workshop seminar? It was like a workshop like a three-day thing. week long. It was like, yeah, once every... One, yeah. one day for... Uh, one day a week for a month. And then you did a set at the end. Gotcha. And this is in the 90s. And... Uh, uh, performed at the end and just loved it. Like mm -hmm. something clicked. But I, you know, even when I was in college, the night before I graduated, I said to a friend of mine, uh, I told her, I was like, you know, I just want to be a, an actor and a comedian, but everyone wants to do that. And she was like, no, not everyone wants to do that. And I thought she was kind of lying. Mm -hmm. I was like, well, I, talk, I told the one person my truth <laughs> and it ends up being the person that doesn't want to be an actor and a comedian. So it was a long process to, um, and I am grateful to, uh, you know, that I found my passion mm. or the, my passions, I should say. Yeah. I, when I was, um, I finished playing professional football, arena football, which is really Getting paid 300 bucks a week is not professional, but I was getting paid to play what I loved, right? That's impressive. Maybe like you in the first year of like, hey, if I got 30 bucks at the door, it was worth it, <laughs> if right? If that, yeah. <laughs> 30 bucks at the door. Yeah. And I remember when I was done, I had no clue what I was going to do next after my dream was over of playing football. And I met a guy who said, who was a public speaker, and he would travel and do college tours and get paid like 10 grand a pop. I was like, how do you get paid to speak? I can't even speak in front of a group of five or ten without getting yeah. nervous, like you said. He said, you got to join this thing called Toastmasters. Yeah, I, I remember I looked into it. Yeah, which yeah. is kind of like, I don't know, improv for public speaking, I guess. Yeah. And uh, so I did that every single week for a year. And I was horrible in the beginning. But at the end, I felt like I finally had that confidence just by doing the thing I was afraid of. Yeah. Now, yeah. did you jump in right after that into touring and no, doing no, the there local, was, you know? There was, uh, you know, it was a good six or seven years of just eating shit. Uh, just, um, you know, my family thought I was crazy. Uh, you know, there was, you know, we live in a day and age where <clears throat> stand-up seems to be everywhere. It's on streaming mm -hmm. audio and visual platforms and... Uh, you know, there's satellite radio and YouTube and Everything. Comedy Central. But back then it was, stand-up had almost shifted into this kind of um, bad joke on The Simpsons. Mm. And so it was not some, like there was this mini boom, I think in the late 80s, and then it shrunk. And so there were a lot of comedians and not a lot of places to do it in front of an audience. So, mm. uh, yeah, it was hard to, and they didn't, they didn't need another white guy. You know what I mean? And there were comedians that had started a couple of years before me, like Dave Attell and Louis C.K., that were great. So, like, they didn't need it. The world doesn't need any comedians. Mm -hmm. You really have to, like, have the audacity to just go, I'm going to do this. And for me, it was, I think it was, you know, I've never done heroin, but I imagine it's like you're chasing <laughs> that high. Yeah, yeah. That first time was pretty empowering. And... um I loved it, you know. What do you think you've learned the most about yourself in 30 years of comedy? Biggest lesson you've learned about who you are? Uh, there's been so many. I mean, stand-up is a conversation with the audience, and uh, I mean, it's not a fair conversation. One side has a microphone, and mm -hmm. the other side is allowed to laugh or be quiet, right? right. But um, I think that... I mean, I've learned so much, you know, it's, and some of it's stuff you don't want to learn, you know, like, like what? Well, I think even when I was in the, you know, growing up in the Midwest, I thought, uh, you know, I grew up in a small town in Indiana and I would look around and with my friends, I'd be like, there was a mistake. We're not supposed to be here. Uh, but when I finally got to the East Coast and started doing stand up, everyone was like, you're Midwestern. And I was like, wait a minute, <laughs> but I just left there right. because I didn't fit in there. Mm hmm um stand up uh, you know you learn you stand up i i think there's an awareness there's nothing normal about going on stage and making strangers laugh uh but and there's innumerable things i've learned uh i've learned that i'm vulnerable i've uh learned that uh that you know stand up has allowed me to articulate some anger probably mm -hmm. in a palatable way 
Uh, I've learned that um, how I come across. I've learned that my upbringing uh, was relatively sheltered. Mm -hmm. You know that uh, you know there are socioeconomic differences. You know beyond kind of like. Uh, the fact that I grew up kind of in a rural suburban environment. Um, yeah, I don't know. I feel like I have, um, I've learned humility maybe. Really? Yeah. And that, you know, and that's not to say that I don't have to learn it over and over mm -hmm. again, but, um, you know, stand up, there's no guarantees. And so, but that's also probably what I like about it. Really? Right? I think I like the risk and the conversation and, um, you know, keeping that conversation interesting. I don't know. What's the thing you've learned about people in 30 years of doing stand-up? Oh, wow. Um, I think I've learned that, uh, here's what I would say, all right? I mean, I, <laughs> this is what, this is my personal philosophy. Yeah. Okay? I believe that you can either I think human beings are very easily manipulated, mm. and I think that <laughs> you can either you can either lead them to light mm -hmm. or darkness. We all, you know, like the most emotionally evolved person loves blood and sex, mm -hmm. and the thing is, is that you know if you bring light to them they will respond with light. But if you bring darkness, you know, because we're animals. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? It's yeah. like if there is carnage, they'll want more carnage. Right. And so I think probably like <clears throat> seven years in, I learned that um, if you talk, if you treat people like they are uh, intelligent, sensitive people, that maybe uh, they'll respond in kind. Mm -hmm. um, it's weird, you know, it's like you see uh, movies or TV shows that are graphic and dark and it reminds us that this is a brutal existence. And then uh, with comedy, you can also bring um, observations and self-awareness in a way that where we can <clears throat> laugh at ourselves. Yeah. And I knew that I didn't want to do comedy at the expense of someone else, because I feel like I, you know, maybe as a, a young, awkward, pale kid, I didn't want to subject that to someone else. Yeah. But um, and again, it's not perfect. I'm always learning, you know. But uh, you haven't figured it out yet. I haven't figured it out. <laughs> well, not consistently, yeah. right? Months, maybe. You know, it's like having kids. It's like first day of school, I'm like, you're going to go and find that kid that feels uncomfortable and you're mm. going to go over and you're going to say hi to them. Mm. And it's like, that's the kind of thing that, you know, I think, you know, we can always have a little bit more of that. Yeah. And so I don't want my stand up to be those people, those idiots. I want it to be kind of like, we're all kind of idiots. <laughs> Do you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. Or I'm an idiot, right. but maybe you can see yourself in me. Yeah. Because I understand that it's appealing to say those idiots, mm -hmm. but that's, we're all idiots. We're all at idiots. different stages of our life, and it's right? it's also it's it's not constructive, right? Do you know what I mean? It's being better than or less than or whatever. Yeah, yeah. I think that's a constant struggle, mm -hmm. right? I mean, that was the other thing that I think I really learned uh, was. We intellectually know we can't get caught up in other people's expectations, but we end up kind of sliding into that constantly. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, uh, this movie, American Dreamer, <clears throat> I really just want, uh, I love acting. Uh, I love the opportunity that it presented. And I want, you know, this is my goal. My goal is for other directors and writers to see this film. But that being said, I also have been on this planet long enough to know that my ego will be like, yeah, but I'd also like, uh, uh, you know, it would be nice if, if someone said I was good. Do you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, of course. But like, intellectually, I know what I should focus on. Yeah. Because I think there was so much frustration for me in my career around seven or eight years where I was like, you know, I'm going to be... 
because all my friends had uh, appeared on late night shows like Conan and Letterman and The Tonight Show, and that was how things were measured at that point. That I and I had gone like three years where I was like, it's it's. I had to face the reality. It was never. It was there was a possibility it was never going to happen, and so I had to realize, all right, why am I doing this? Mm. Am I doing it for some kind of accolade or fame, mm. or am I doing it because it's creatively fulfilling? And so I really, you know, and some of it was therapy, but I was like, all right, so I'm doing this because I enjoy it, because in every set, uh, you know, I might come up with a new line that's mm -hmm. uh, gratifying and... Uh, you know, it's nice to make a room full of people laugh. Yeah. So let's focus on that. Bring people so joy, yeah. That's, you know, that creative fulfillment pursuit is is something that I've learned over and over again. I've taken uh, acting jobs that, you know, reinforce that. It's like, yeah. did I take this acting job because it was pleasing my ego? Or because, you know, other people were like, you're going to get this amount every week. <laughs> And you're like, oh, that's great, but like, the gym I know doesn't care about that. Mm. The you know, so I care about the fact that I can act or play a complex, layered character. Yeah, I know that sounds corny, but no, I think it's interesting. Have you ever taken a job or a gig or a show for the ego or the accolades, and then? falling flat on your face because it wasn't for creative pursuits or it wasn't to bring people joy. Yeah, no, I I, uh, I worked on a TV show that, um, you know, there was pilot season, there was a lot of close calls mm -hmm. and uh, that frustration. So after I had learned this lesson in stand-up to just kind of focus on, I love doing this, I then had to learn that in acting. So I had some sitcom roles and uh, I reoccurred on some good shows. And then I had, um, through pilot season, I had tested for uh, shows that people might have heard of, like Arrested Development, The Office, mm -hmm. and um, really close calls. And then because of that, because of not getting those i think i was like i need something to prove that i'm an actor so i accepted a, a a role in a show that was didn't have a lot of opportunities for me to have uh you know opportunities to act yeah and so as a result of me kind of grabbing appeasement for my ego i ended up being on a show where, uh, you know, I spent two years going, can I have more things to do? Not mm. lines, but can I have more things to do? And they were like, no, it was always that size part. Wow. So that's a good example of right. me <laughs> really messing up. Who do you think was uh, more influential in your life growing up, mom or dad? <sighs> um, you know, I, I think that... Um, the compassion of my mother mm. was because she was somebody that I knew uh, loved me no matter what. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, um, something that was huge. I think that also she was somebody, I had all these older siblings that, um, and my brother right above me was better at football. He was mm -hmm. smarter. He was... Uh, you know, he was better at everything. Did everything. Yeah, he was. Uh, and um, my, my mom did say, there is something that you're, like he could whistle before me, he could do all these things. <laughs> that sounds stupid, but all the, little the things, boy the in yeah. you remembers stuff like that. And, um, and my mom said, you know, there's something <laughs> that you're good at that's probably, you're probably better than Joe at. Wow. And I remember that there wasn't her betraying Joe. It was... Something where I was always kind of second fiddle. Because he's, by the way, in my family, I'm considered third funniest. Really? Yes. Oh so it's like um, hearing that, I think, was important. But I also think that um, my father had this work ethic. I don't, you know, like... 
this is my mm. takeaway from it. But you know, on Saturdays and Sundays, kids used to go and do stuff. But my dad would be like, "No, we're doing yard work." And then he would reward us with McDonald's, right. and we thought it was a good deal. Right. So we would work for like six hours, and he'd be like, "I'm going to take you to I McDonald's." You're like this, yeah. that's, that works out. <laughs> and um, so, I think his work ethic, and mm. I think also, um, you know, he was also somebody that, uh, you know, he, you know, it was complex. You know, it's like the father son relationship is complex. complex and I think that uh, but I also think that I'm a combination of all my siblings too and seeing them pursue things or them struggle with things was uh, I think was very beneficial to have that mm -hmm. perspective but also uh, I don't know you know I wish I feel very lucky mm -hmm. you know there's you know, I'm, I have five kids and there's times when, you know, I have a 15 year old who's, she's very into music and, and, uh, there's part of me that remember like in dead poet society, there was the dad who was oh, man. very discouraging of the son the actor. Yeah. Yeah. And it, you know, and, but the entertainment industry is so random. I mean, they're very talented people that can't get arrested. Uh, and many of them are my friends. Yeah. And and so, like, my joke is, like, you know, that mean dad in Dead Poet Society, he might have been right. Yeah. Because it is so, and there is something about uh, the entertainment industry that is kind of unnecessarily cruel. I mean, life is cruel. Yeah. But... You know, as a parent, you don't want your child to kind of... <clears throat> <clears throat> but would you have wanted your dad to say, eh, after three years, stop this comedy thing. You know, go back to your finance job. Well, I, I actually think that it was really beneficial that I did come from a family that my pursuit of this was relatively insane. I mean... Really? They were yeah. like, what are you doing? Yeah, they were, well, they were like, you know, Jimmy, he's a little crazy. You know what I mean? Right. They're like... Once a week is a hobby. He's, fine. You know, yeah, his mother died and now he's doing this thing, you know, right. and he's doing stand-up, but he doesn't make a living doing it. <clears throat> right. Like, there's a practicality. Especially in the 90s, right? Or yeah. Or when this was. Yes. Yeah. And, and so there's this practicality of... I remember my brother-in-law at one point, he goes, so you go out and you do stand-up <laughs> every night... And when you do get paid, you get how much? And I go, eight bucks. <laughs> and he would be like, why would you do that? And I go, because I enjoy it. And he goes, why don't you get more than eight bucks? And I'm like, that's what they pay. Uh -huh. And in fact, I don't really care about the money. You know, I'll go around New York City doing spots and, uh, you know, the stage time is payment. I mean, uh -huh. that's not to say that I don't enjoy You want the money. money. Yeah, yeah. You, you want know, the money now. But you got five kids to feed. I got five kids. And yeah. you've been doing it for 30 years. I think I read on Forbes, I don't know if this was a few months ago, um, that you're one of the top three highest grossing comedians. Is that touring comedians or comedians in general? I think it's touring comedians, but touring it's also, comedians. it's, you know, the, the Forbes thing is like, is it an exact science? Right. No, but it is. Let's just say you're number one. No, no, <laughs> I'm no. Just, I'm, I'm saying just... that like, it's one of those things where. You know, there's there's all these calculations, right? Right, right? And the entertainment industry is the perception business. It is. And, you know, I'm a pudgy, balding, pale guy. And so, and I talk about horses for 10 minutes in my special. <laughs> so there's not something sexy. So like, yeah. I'm like, all right, you know, do I, you know, do I want to get the phone calls from every organization because they saw that Forbes list? No, but... I also, you know, I need some producers to know that I have some success. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Yeah, I get it. The thing that I loved about um, what I read there, and who knows what's true or not, is that you had this opportunity to take a Netflix deal, and you decided not to, yeah. and you went the Amazon Prime route plus just your own distribution. Yeah. And you decided to bet on yourself, which I yeah. think is really cool. Because Louis C.K. did that, you, yeah. was that five, six years ago, seven years ago or something? Yeah. And it seems like you're trying to do this, you're trying to kind of reinvent that model. Yeah, there is something about, stand-up has changed so much just 
during the course of my career. I mean, Seinfeld started in the 70s. Crazy. and uh, But how comedy is consumed or uh, <clears throat> it has changed dramatically. Yeah. Like, and it, I have a belief that it changes every five years. So in 2006, when Beyond the Pale aired on Comedy Central, that was a time when every dorm room had a TV and cable and mm -hmm. the and the TV was on Comedy Central. When I went to college, there was maybe a TV in the lobby, but right. I don't even know if you had cable in colleges. This was in the 1800s. No, but like there was, so, and then it shifted and Netflix was this enormous factor. And, um, and there's different things. Like even when I released, uh, Noble Ape on kind of multiple platforms. That was something because I had I have right now five specials on Netflix, wow. and so there is a balance five. of of going different places yeah. and expanding your audience. And some of it is you also want people to see it. Right. So there was I was also hearing from people like I don't have Netflix. Why can't I see this? Mm -hmm. And so then. That's why I did the distribution model where it went everywhere at the same time because there are a lot of people that watch things on demand. Mm -hmm. And you know, some of these things uh, I experience and some of them I, I learn that, you know, like I have young kids, so I buy everything on iTunes, but a lot of people are like, I'll watch a movie once, but when you have a kid, you might as well want, you might as well buy it because yeah. you're gonna, they're gonna watch it 10 times. <laughs> and so, but the Amazon Prime thing, was an interesting idea uh, and you know and in in Netflix defense they've got five specials in some ways they don't need another don't need one, another one. Yeah, yeah. but uh, there is also looking at the streaming services in you know if we had a conversation six months from today you know Disney is going to be in the game uh, uh -huh. HBO Max is going to be in the game. Uh, there's going to be Apple's going to be in the game. Yeah. It's it's going to shift. I don't know. You know, people are always talking like, is it going to end with three? Is it going to end with five? But what's fascinating is when I started stand up, the only place you could see it was on late night shows or on Ha <clears throat> TV, mm -hmm. which was Comedy Central, or MTV had a show, yeah. you know what I mean? Did HBO do comedy specials then? They did, they did. HBO yeah. was obviously very important, yeah. but... You like made it if you were on HBO. That was like the golden That was standard. That was the, the most important thing. And that shifts also. So, mm -hmm. you know, The Tonight Show shifted to The Letterman Show, and then HBO retained this prestige. It still has <clears throat> incredible prestige, yeah. but the you know netflix has gained importance but also like even when i went to amazon prime i didn't know how many people had amazon prime right. so like my special on amazon prime the feedback i received from the amazon prime special to my last netflix special i would say the amazon prime feedback was twice as much wow and some of that is if you look at netflix um, I describe it like this. There's like, so there's, much content there. There's so much content. And so if content, and it's, and it's good content, a of lot course. of it's good. You know, if those are, if comedy specials are like floaties in a swimming pool, the pool is covered with floaties. Yes. Whereas at Amazon Prime, I knew. There's a couple floaties. There'd be a couple. Wow. And so I knew that the balance of that was advantageous to me because yeah. in the end again i just want people to see my comedy so that they'll come and see my show do you know what i mean touring yeah yeah and you know it's it is it's fun also there's you know you have to kind of it's all constructed on self-assignment so you have mm -hmm. to sit there and go all right i'm gonna i'm gonna tell some stories i'm gonna address something that's a little bit more taboo and, you know, my friend Ty Glass, you know, when he, uh, sometimes he'll open for me and he's like, there you are, kind of like purifying your audience because uh -huh. you'll say things that some people will be like, I'm out. And you're like, you know what, it's good to kind of, 
you know cleanse it all yeah yeah it's good to cleanse it because yeah i am a clean comedian mm -hmm. um i do love my wife and children but i'm flawed so i don't <laughs> want people to think i'm a saint right you know what i mean did you think the 22 year old jimmy ever think that you'd get here now no you're, you're i making 30 whatever it said 30 million a year or whatever with yeah with i no i i top gross uh, my goal was to uh to you know i wanted to be a writer on the letterman show and uh i mean i had fantasies of acting i had you know but even back then the people that were touring doing theaters were only legends it was only carlin mm -hmm. and it was only mm -hmm. cosby that were touring you know seinfeld could have but he was on a tv show at the time so it was not like that was even an option and i viewed um, touring, going to comedy clubs, I was like, I don't know if I want to do that. Yeah. But it's, you know, it's also something that I really enjoy. By the way, you know, headlining the first, that segue into headlining, doing smaller sets and then doing an hour set, that's pretty terrifying because you fall on your face. You got another you, 45 minutes to go, you're like... <laughs> you fall on your face hard. <clears throat> yeah. And... So there is something about the bravery and the comfort, you know, it's the balance of comfort and being brave. So I remember being at the DC Improv and they were nice enough to let me headline and I pretty much bombed. Really? Yeah. How long was the set? It was probably 45 minutes. What, do you, do after, right. what do you do after 10 minutes when you're like, wow, I'm not getting anything here? Crickets, well, some of it, some of it was, uh, you know, it was okay. But you're the headliner. But you're the headliner. You're like the main course. And, um, you know, I guess I felt bad. There was this guy who probably, uh, John X was his name. Uh, his last name is like a, a Greek name that starts with X, but he went by John X. And he had kind of stuck out his neck and say, we should headline Jim Gaffigan. <clears throat> and I was more worried about getting him in trouble. Oh, man. So, but doesn't every great anyone have to go through extreme embarrassment over and over again in order to get through the other side? I think, yeah, there's, there's like... Comedians, actors, public speakers, whatever it may be, athletes. Everything. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's like you have to, you have to to fail, and I think that's an advantage of having children. Is you see them going to school for the first day, and they're like a combination of excitement and terrified, <clears throat> or right. they're playing soccer on a team and they kick the ball the wrong way. It's like. Like, as, as adults, we kind of navigate this world by, like, all right, I'm not doing that again. But as kids, they don't have that, the benefit of experience. And so seeing my children bravely do things, uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's brutal. Mm -hmm. But it's, that does provide some of the bravery to go on stage and, even if it's, you know, do a joke that falls flat or yeah. gets misinterpreted and, you know, it's like, you know, you're, you're, uh, you know, you, you're reminded through your children that you right. have to do that. You have to constantly. Do you ever feel you got five kids and do you ever feel, and you're touring how many days a year on know, average? Like two weekends a month. Two weekends a month. Okay. Do you ever feel, that's not that bad then. I thought you were going a lot longer. It's, yeah, it's, it, you know, if you looked at my calendar, it looks like I'm gone every day, yeah. but you know, and then there'll be a week where I'll be in like Europe, but then my right, family right. will meet me. Gotcha. You know what I mean? So gotcha. it, it's all constructed on not being away too, too long. long. Have yeah. you been able to balance that pretty well? Being, you know, it's, you know, it's something I learn and then relearn yeah. and then, uh, relearn. So hopefully the, you know. When I'm in the hospital bed, I don't go, oh, no, I did it wrong. Right. But it is a constant balance. I think there's a balance between, like, being that I'm not a father yet. So, yeah. But my girlfriend says she wants to have five kids so I can see myself where you're at. Uh, she, I, I can see the balance between, like, being the example for your kids and saying, I'm going after the thing that I love. Yeah. And I want you to be able to do that and, sh and having yeah. that example, but also being there for them yeah. and spending quality time. Yeah, right. it is. It is a balance, and there is, 
you know, it's being a parent is terrifying because, you know, you know, Khalil Gibran, you know, like these children are on loan, you know, and you're, (laughs) you don't want to mess up and you know, you're going to fail. You know what I mean? And so there is this, and I waver in between, you know, uh, letting them find their own path and also, you know, my dad, like being kind of a, a bastard, not, not necessarily a bastard, but like, Mm. no, you can't do that. Like making sure that my children hear no, you Mm. know, I want them to like me, right? but I also, my responsibility is to make sure that they're not douchebags. Right. Right. Isn't that the bigger task? It's true. Being a good human being. Yeah. And your your wife. I'm also lucky because my wife is an amazing part. Yeah. So, but a couple of years ago, she had a a health scare, right? Yeah. She yeah. She had a brain surgery. She had a brain tumor, a tumor the size of a pear that was mm-hmm. right on her brain stem. Uh, and that must have been scary. Beyond scary, uh, absolutely terrifying. And then, uh, you know, it was, you know, a, a level of terror that you can't kind of articulate. And there's, there's, you know, there's also, in you know, and every I think humans having toured with Nobile, where I discuss a lot of this, it, w- it became very apparent that we all have this experience of a loved one, whether it's a grandparent or, yeah. God forbid, a child going through this life or death kind of struggle. But I think that humans, we kind of shut it off because we can't live in that reality. We can't live in the reality that we're all going to die. Yeah. And the people we love are going to die. And what was terrifying was also that you know, you know, initially it was a brain tumor on, you know, uh, these important cranial nerves that, you know, cover swallowing and wow. She eyesight. couldn't swallow for a while. She couldn't swallow. She couldn't eat anything for couldn't two months. Couldn't drink water. And, and she couldn't drink water. And she was <clears throat> living with a guy who's a glutton. And so, but it was like, there was wow. the brain tumor. And then there was a moment... So the brain tumor was removed, and my wife is such the size of a pear. Size of a pear. That's like that crazy. Big. At the, you know, like where the the surgeon was like, I'm not sure how you're walking around right now, and so they removed that. There was because I'm also, I think stand up comedy. You learn how to read people, mm-hmm. not perfectly, but you can read people. You can see kind of fear in facial expressions or kind of like vocal inflections that would communicate that they're uncomfortable and i was always trying to read this uh brain surgeon uh and <laughs> who by the way um that's an impossible job being, oh my uh, being a doctor is just insane and so I what are the chances it. what's the recovery time i don't know 40 percent well that's it's like and they have to no be idea. this they have to like I don't think people realize, I mean, I'm sure people do, but like I was shocked to realize how they have to navigate expectations because they have to temper everything. Like I'm very confident, you know, like their words are so selective, but there was reading this brain surgeon because after she got, after they removed the brain tumor, uh, then she got pneumonia. And that's when I saw the fear in his eyes. And I remember Mm. just the flash of his eyes where this brilliant, uh, confident, compassionate man had fear in his eyes. And I was like, you know, it was just like, and I was very much resigned to the fact I'm like, well, okay, you know, uh, you know, uh, I've got to put my children first. It's kind of I've had a good run. Wow. Uh, you know, uh, you know. You're already going there. I was already kind of like, all right, this is. Touring's done. Because I was, always, I always had the <clears throat> belief that, uh, you, you know, that I got to, I, I was lucky enough to find an occupation that I loved that somehow the universe or God was like, you can have what you, you can do what you love or you can have a family. Like in my 30s, I was like, I get to do what I like, you know? I don't have control over this. So I got both of them. And so in that moment, I kind of had this belief of like, 
okay, you got to do what you like. Now you have to take care of these five right. children. You got a 25 year good run at it. Yes, yeah. You, you lived your childhood dream, you inspired yes. people, you made people laugh. But now you are going to wow. shift gears. And so there was this uh, reality. And of course, my wife is such a tank that, you know, she pulled through even when uh, I could see in that surgeon's eyes that he was not confident. Was five, ten percent. Yeah, yeah, I think, you know, I don't know. But like it's, you know, it's like I had been looking at this guy's eyes for you know, and that's for, uh, you know, the entire time period, which was the only thing that we did over those five or six days. And then she got out of the pneumonia and she couldn't eat or drink. Mm. And so you're dealing yeah. with She's the... up with an IV, probably getting fluids. Unbelievable. And, and that uh, she couldn't talk. Um, and, you know, my wife... Loves to talk. <laughs> so you're like, this and, is actually kind of nice. <laughs> and I love for a second. Yeah, yeah I love. No, that was totally the joke. <laughs> and then, um, but she, you know, it's like we were very lucky, you know, and mm. she's a very spiritual person. Yeah. And uh, I think she found great strength in that. And what did that experience give you? Oh, you know, that experience gave me uh, a much more positive view of human beings um the support from not only her family which was amazing but and our you know the community of friends and uh you know parents of my children's friends which was amazing or you know our church that we go to like people step up you're like oh this is this is why people have these things you know mm -hmm. these support groups but generally, the the consensus on you know social media because my wife got out of this and she wanted um, she wanted to communicate uh, to people that uh, you can live through this because mm -hmm. when we dis when she discovered she had a brain tumor the size of a pear, the first thing she did was go to Google and like who had a tumor in their cranial nerves that is fine and she couldn't find anyone so oh. once she got through she wanted to make sure that information was out there she's got a book coming out too yeah she this, has a book coming out this month or next month yeah or? october 1st yeah. and so i was relatively reluctant uh you know it's strange we live in this um voyeuristic uh -huh. exhibitionist culture and there are certain things you want to share and certain things you you know do we want to share this right but obviously I was going to do whatever she wanted. And it was, you know, there was something about, you know, eventually I would do stand up on it. But like when the outpouring of support, it's like human beings, you know, there's, there's a real good side to people. And like the generosity <clears throat> is, um, is, you know, there isn't a boundary to it necessarily. I mean, I'll be in an airport and people will be like, how's your wife? Wow. So it's That's pretty, cool. it's pretty cool. That's it's cool. pretty cool. Like, yeah. I know we live in kind of a, an angry time, but human beings are all right. They're pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. When stuff is really going dark, yeah. it's like they want to be there. Yeah. Friend. That's powerful. And did you feel like you became a better father and a better comedian with that experience? Or? Yeah. No, it was. the same. Uh, and she kind of details it in the book. It was, so my wife is, um, I kind of refer to her as, I mean, she was the executive producer of this TV show that we wrote together. But she has, you know, become the executive producer of my life right. and my family's life. So what transpired there was I had to adopt I had to switch the role from care receiver to caregiver. Mm -hmm. And I think, I know I was terrified and I'm sure she, <laughs> she was, was like, like, I don't know if this, this guy, guy can do this. <laughs> do you know what I mean? And so, um, yeah, there's, you know, I, you know, being a caregiver is. Uh, it's a different role. It's a different role. Yeah. And it's also, it's, I don't think people vocalize. It's, it's brutal. It's brutal because you're not only the press secretary of uh, the situation, but you're, you know, 
There's no real breaks. And by no. the way, the person that's going through this incredible recovery is got it worse, obviously. But I, I have a lot of, uh, I gained a, a real empathy for people that, um, that are in that caregiving role. Yeah. And uh, it's not easy. It's, it's a hard job. It's not easy. There's not, um, you know, there's not a really, I mean, you're doing it all for the right reasons, but there's, you know, and by the way, you know, my wife, when she was going through some of this recovery, she didn't know I was there. Do you know what I mean? Right. And so, like, there was a time at a anniversary. She was like, "Why weren't you at the hospital?" And I'm like, "I was there, sitting next <laughs> to you the whole time." Yeah. <laughs> you. And so it's like, but that's not her fault. She was yeah, kind of, of course. in and out of consciousness. And so there is something about, and there's also something really kind of special about getting that opportunity to show up for someone. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So like, there is something rather special about. Uh, being the guy or the life partner you want to be. Do you know what I mean? Of course, yeah. And I understand it, it, some people freak out and they're like, <clears throat> I gotta go. Right. But I wasn't that. That's good. Great. That allowed you the opportunity to step up. Yeah. And show what you're made of. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I've got a few questions left for you. I want to respect sure. your time, but I have a, a couple questions more. Um, this is about winning over a crowd. Okay. When you feel like, I'm curious what you feel like your keys would be if, if you could simplify it for people listening who maybe are public speakers or maybe are performers or actors yeah. who feel like they've lost the crowd or they feel like they're about to go on to their, their stage, whatever their stage may be. Yeah. What would you say are the kind of fundamental keys to winning over a crowd quickly when you step on stage or when you've lost it and you've got to give them back? Well, there's a balance, right? Um, because, you know, even our society has shifted. Yes. Uh, in, I mean, I'm a, a big believer in being self-effacing. Mm -hmm. But there are also situations where that comes across as weakness. Right. And that weakness can make, since we're animals, the weakness can be like, uh, you know, encourage disruption, right? Mm-hmm. But I would say that, um, you know, you can say anything if you lay the tracks for it. What do you mean by that? So, you know, there's occasionally you'll see someone say something uh, that is irreverent or kind of shocking. But if they had set it up in the right way, or something bold. It's just like any good car salesman, the right? Context, the context. It's the context. Yeah. And so I think that for um, stand-up, you know, there is also like an authority thing where you have to go on stage and be in charge. People want someone in charge. Uh -huh. They don't want someone. I mean, I know I'm saying contradictory things. Right, right, right. right? But it I'm makes saying, sense. Be, be in charge, but be self-deprecating. But the vulnerability is what people empathize with. I mean, so how, Richard, do you, how do you get Richard charge? Pryor is one of the yeah. best comedians to ever walk on this planet. <clears throat> and if you watch him, he is completely vulnerable the entire time. But he also has a sense of authority. How do you do both? I think some of it is. <laughs> I think some of it is. Uh, is is trial and error and i think some of its preparation too mm -hmm. i think if you're not prepared uh that's a big problem yeah and that's like you know and i know that like there are people like i think dave Chappelle can walk on any stage and just and crush just by looking but at people. you know what and, and that's good and but you know that's not everyone like yeah. i can't do that yeah. um and some of it is understanding the environment I mean, it is measuring. It's like, do, do these people want to be here? Do they all have things in common? Did they, did they play golf all day? Mm -hmm. did, how do they view me? Do you know what I mean? Because if I go on stage in front of uh, an audience that likes my comedy, that's a different task than going on stage in front of high school students who don't know who you are that just yeah. look at me as like an old dude <laughs> right? right and so 
I think, you know, maybe it's not vulnerability, it's self-awareness. Uh-huh. And that self-awareness changes. So when I do international shows, I'm not this doughy white guy. Mm. I'm an American. Really? I'm an American who, and granted, there, there's often Americans in the audience, but um, so the task might be different there. It might be prove to us that you're not a dumb American. Mm. And some of that is, I personally love other cultures and I'm fascinated by, uh, you know, different things like that. And so that can be achieved by doing research wow. on that country or city. Mm-hmm. And then, um, I don't know, it's ever, and by the way, these are the conversations that comedians have all the time. Really? And some <clears throat> people have an intangible ability to, um, and some of it's a sheer confidence. Like I think uh, Seinfeld and mm-hmm. Chris Rock, <clears throat> Chris Rock is amazing. Have a uh, a confidence that is people find inspiring. Yeah. You know what I mean? And they're like, "All right, yeah, let's see what he's got to say." Whereas um, someone like Jonathan Winters, it's a different thing, yeah. right? He's a self-contained kind of. But even even if you look at Robin Williams stuff, it's very vulnerable. Yeah. Like I think that overall um, there's a, a bravery and a vulnerability. I know it's contradictory, but like if you look at <laughs> George Carlin and vulnerability, yeah, yeah. Like George Carlin, people love what he says, but sometimes they didn't <clears throat> love it in that moment. Mm. Because I also think that there is. And this is, I've never talked to, uh, I've talked to other comedians about this. I think there's an aftertaste to humor. And let me, let me articulate like it this way. Later that night you think about it. Yeah. And there's also, we all have that kind of nasty bitchy friend yeah. who is kind of like ripping into people and you kind of laugh along and it's entertaining, but you also, uh, an hour later, you're like, you know, I, do you know what I mean? So there's an aftertaste. Yeah. And so sometimes even like some anger, uh, whether you agree with it or not, you're like, there's an aftertaste mm-hmm. to it. Or even <laughs> kind of guilty pleasures. We all have guilty pleasures. Yeah. There is an aftertaste to it. So, um, and that was, that was something I learned later on. It wasn't something like, I'm going to institute this. <laughs> aftertaste theory it's just something that it's like why do we love certain movies so much i think you know shawshank redemption so good there's an aftertaste so there good. right and it is some of it's morgan freeman some of it's the story yeah. some of it's you know uh you know it's just the whole shebang yeah. right it's the vulnerability of different characters and so there is something about the aftertaste of it yeah Wow. Uh, it's always about food with me. I love it. <laughs> um, this question is what I ask everyone towards the end of the show. It's called The Three Truths. Okay. So imagine um, it's your last day on earth. Okay. Many years from now. Okay. You get to live as old as you want to be, but okay. eventually you got to go somewhere else. Yeah. And you've achieved every dream that you set out in your mind. Okay. It's all been created, the shows, movies, whatever. You've yeah. got your own network, whatever it is you want to yeah. do. Have 10 more kids. Yeah, it's all there. You've created yeah. it. You've done it, but for whatever reason, uh, in this world, you've got to take all of your work with you. So all of your books and series and videos and content, yeah. it's all gone. So no one has access to your information anymore that you've created. But you get to leave behind three things you know to be true about all the lessons you've learned in your life that you would then kind of give as your Bible these three truths to the world to have. What would you say are your three lessons that you would leave behind or what I like to call three truths? Ooh, that's interesting. Well, I think intellectually we all know this, but I think that um, in the end it's, you know, I am a parent and in the end it's uh, your children are, that's, you know, that's, that's the end equation, mm. right? Uh, when you're dying, there isn't someone from the Grammy nominating committee. Thanks for those four right. albums. You know, uh, <laughs> so that is something that I think people lose 
we all lose sight of like that and whether that you know for me it's my children for some people it's close friends or whatever that's that's where you're gonna be measuring yourself mm -hmm. is uh that level of humanity um i also what would, uh, you, what would you say about that then what would your truth be around children or parenting or that you uh that that's the most and if you have a child that's the most you mm -hmm. that's that's your only job mm -hmm. everything else is kind of a hobby okay um uh and then uh I don't even know if I'm doing this right. Yeah, um, it's good. All right. So <laughs> another truth is that um, he, he, you know you can't rely on uh, other people to do things. Mm. Like there's a romantic notion. There's stories of Hollywood, someone being in a soda shop, and you know someone being discovered. But the reality mm. is, is not only do you have to do it yourself, but you have to find your own path. Mm. And um, you have to assume that you're gonna have to do absolutely everything. You didn't, you know, so you, you know, like this whole studio or whatever, yeah. this podcast, it was, it was, a lot it was you. Yeah, it was all. It wasn't someone coming in and going, hey, you're an interesting guy, here <laughs> no, you go. No, no one's <laughs> right. It. It's, no one uh, gave me anything, yeah. There's, so I guess maybe there's like, there's no excuse for hard work, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And yeah. Um, you better love it. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. okay. um, that's that's uh, two. Two. Uh, I would say, uh, is it a lesson? It's like the the lesson you would leave behind. Like, here are my principles of life. These three things I would share as my truths. For, it could be for your kids, for your yeah. audiences, for the world. I would say that uh, don't get caught up in other people's expectations. Mm. And uh, and that goes back to even the beginning of my story. Like I studied finance because I more or less listened to what I thought I should do. Mm -hmm. And then, um, you know, seeking things that I think society would or the entertainment industry would value rather than what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And so other people's expectations, um, not only are they unwise, but they are dangerous. Mm. Like be very wary of other people's expectations. It's not a conspiracy, but they're not you. They're not you. They don't know your whole context, your whole life, and you what have your to dreams keep, are. You yeah. have to keep asking yourself, and so there's a lot of people, I mean, I don't know. I can only speak for myself. There's a lot of times where I'm like, wait, I don't even want to do this. Right. You know, what am I doing? Why, why did I say yes to this? Yeah. Thing? I mean, by the way, it's like, you're in shape. I'm not in shape. It's like, I have to decide that I want to be in shape. Mm -hmm. And I say that to my kids. Not, they're in perfect shape. But I'm like, work hard in school, but don't do it for me. Right. Do you know what I mean? And my mom actually told me that. Mm. It's like, don't do any of this for me. You know, because if you're doing it for someone else, you're going to resent that person or you're not going to do it. Yeah. Like, you have to do it for yourself. It's interesting because there's, there's kind of a contradiction there. You know, we should do things for ourselves, but we should also be doing things to support other people. Like, Absolutely. you're doing things also to inspire your kids. You're not yes. doing it for them, but you yeah. want to be a model... Yeah. You want to be an example and things like that as well, right? Yeah, and I think, yeah. It's not because they want you to do it. Right. right. It's a strange kind of, uh, it's weird because it could slide into narcissism, yeah, could, right? Yeah. You could be like, do it just for yourself. Yeah, right. Forget about these other people getting in your way. Yeah, yeah. But it's like, yeah, you know, and I think that's, it's, you know, becoming the person that is, uh, you know, how often do people realize they're doing things yeah. for their parents? Right. I mean, you know what I mean? It takes them a while, probably. And, and, or for society in the whole. Yeah. What I love about you, Jim, is you, you have a very, uh, you have so much depth to you. 
You, oh, have, you have a lot of depth and your heart is so loving and powerful. Oh, well, thanks. For the first time meeting you and, and only seeing comedy stuff and then last night watching this new movie you have, nice. uh, American Dreamers, uh, I realized that there is so much uh, character to you. Oh, thanks. And I love the complexity that you bring to the movie and to life. Oh, You've had this... Uh, so much experience that you can share yeah. with people now from childhood in the Midwest to uh, your mom yeah. uh, to your wife going through the challenges to seeing the world and, and you know performing in front of millions of people this role you play is not what I expected but it was <laughs> so like rewarding as well oh thanks and uh, can you share us a little bit more about uh, the movie and how people can watch it and why they should watch it. Well, there's what I love about a good movie is that um, people will have different things that they take away from it. You know, good art just presents questions. It doesn't provide answers. There's a lot of questions at the end. Yeah, there's a lot of I was kind of like, I want another five minutes. <laughs> well, it's also, you know, that's, uh, but I think what I, I play this rideshare driver who's on hard times and uh, ends up driving around a drug dealer and he makes some questionable moves, but what- <laughs> Questionable. But what I loved about this character, I mean, you have to like, you have to play characters, you know, you don't have to love them, but you have to like them and you have to like be honest to their truths. I know that sounds kind of, yeah. but you have to be like, this guy's truth is this, and so therefore it makes perfect sense that he would do this. But this guy, like a lot of men, I mean, I generally think, like men, you know, we have to learn to be civilized. We have to learn to kind of uh, not respond emotionally. Yeah. We have to learn, and I see it with my boys, and, and what Cam embodies is a lot of um he doesn't want to take accountability for things oh my gosh. which i identify with yeah i mean i think everyone's guilty of it and he is also someone who is blaming the things around him and blaming the people around him and it's also sad you know because there's there's plenty of work to do on yourself i mean like when you were talking about that it's like you know you're an unfinished project, you know, but that's the truth, right? Yeah, yeah. And and what's so frustrating is we're going to learn these things and then we're going to have to learn them again. Oh, man. Over it's, and over. It's like a torturous journey. Every you're year. You're like, how yeah. could I have to learn this <laughs> lesson that I was so grateful that I learned six months ago? But, and I think that Cam, the, the character I play, he, because um, I can come uh, you know, I, uh, you know, I'm far from a saint, but I think that he also puts things in, um, in compartments yeah. in his head, and I think <clears throat> I've done that where mm. I'm like, you know what, uh, I don't want to find something. Yeah, you like, justify, yeah. rationalize, and I think, you know, I think America does that. I think we do that. Mm. We like. A romantic notion of a country of immigrants but there's a lot of sins you know what I mean and so I think Cam kind of embodies that and he you know he's well intended I think but it's like he's gotta <laughs> oh he's gotta gosh. do some he's gotta take some accountability it is crazy man yeah when you're, I don't want to give it away, but when you're just driving away with uh, both of the back seat, I'm just like, what is going on here? Oh yeah. How could you live with yourself, yeah. knowing the things you've done? You've done yeah. all these things that are yeah. compromised. Um, but people do that. But then you're lying to yourself. You're lying to the people. The back seat. You're. I don't know how. I think society. I think we look at <clears throat> people that do horrible things, and we think they're just those horrible things but you know they were you know the, a series of events went yeah. into it like i i consider myself very fortunate i i've uh you know but we're all a couple bad decisions away from being in a real dark place one bad decision right yeah and um 
And so, I don't know. It's pretty scary. It's, it's, right? it's scary. It's a powerful oh, movie. And where can they get it at? Right, It's out right now. It's out now. And it's, uh, uh, it's in iTunes. select cities. But it's on iTunes. It's on video on demand. Yeah. Uh, but don't watch it with a kid. You no, know, don't. If, if you're a parent, it, you might don't yeah. watch it at night. <laughs> no, it's like, but watch it. It's. I would suggest watching it with someone so that you could have a conversation because there are different. Yeah. And I don't want to plant any seeds because there yeah. are different takeaways. Some people are like mm -hmm. it's commentary on capitalism. Some people yeah. are like it's, you know, it's different things. But I think it's your uh, your character really comes out. You, your personal character comes out in your heart and your complexity so I really appreciate Thank the you. work you put into that and I know that was probably fun and challenging at the same time um, where can we follow you and find you on tour and be part um, of you on social media I'm all over social media and I'm I'm always touring uh, yeah. I love doing stand-up I love coming up with new material and yeah. uh, that's you know I'm gonna do that until people stop coming. Right. You know. So social media, they can follow you. They can see yeah. your tour dates on your website. Yes. It's just your name.com. Yeah. Um, they can get the movie right now. I'm telling you, watch this movie. It's it's pretty fascinating. Um, <clears throat> I have one final question for you. And again, I want to acknowledge you, Jim, for just your heart. I think okay. I, I've met a lot of different comedians and I feel like sometimes they're always on. And you really showed up today with your heart and just oh, sharing your vulnerability. So I really acknowledge that and appreciate, appreciate that. It. Final question is, what is your definition of greatness? That's a, that's a hard one, right? <clears throat> greatness, um, uh, you know, I think it's the greatness is... Uh, a commitment to the journey mm. like I think that you know LeBron James or um, Tom Brady it's like that commitment like I don't even know That's what amazing. they do you hear rumors about <laughs> but you know either of those guys um, I think their greatness is um, constructed on incredible sacrifice yeah and incredible commitment and um, so I think that uh, greatness is, um, uh, I think greatness is such a commitment. I think sometimes we put greatness on things thinking that people are anointed with greatness, but it's earned. Yeah. It's, it's earned and not everyone, everyone should have their own definition of it, but like, you know, uh, and I'm not a Patriots fan, but like um, <laughs> Tom Brady is undeniably great. Yeah. Even if he never wins another one, uh, uh, you know, he serves as an example mm -hmm. of someone that whatever motivates him, it is pretty impressive. It's pretty inspiring. It is. And LeBron's the same way. He's amazing. Yeah. Very cool. Jim, thanks so much, man. Thanks so much. Appreciate it. Thank you, brother.